Good afternoon, and welcome to another in our series of Tommy Talks done by our faculty at the Marshall School of Business at USC. Today, Susan Hermeling, who is an Associate Professor of Clinical Entrepreneurship in the Greif Center for Entrepreneurial Studies at the Marshall School, and an expert on business ethics with research examining the ethical implications of the entrepreneur's decisions in startup phases, is going to talk to us about how decision-making by leaders are impacted with ethical challenges during this global pandemic. Susan's work has been published in top journals, such as Entrepreneurship Theory and Practice, the Journal of Business Ethics, and Business Ethics Quarterly. She has a BA and MBA from Harvard University and a PhD in Entrepreneurship and Ethics from the University of Virginia. Susan, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Hi, Jim. Good to see you, too. Thanks a lot for doing this with me. Tell me how you would advise today's leaders uh, in terms of their best and most ethical approach during this crisis. This is a time where leadership will rise to the top, good leadership will rise to the top, but the ethical issues that are, that are implicit in what's happening today are also there. Uh, what thoughts would you give leaders today's world? So yes, this is an extraordinary global event that calls for extraordinary crisis management. Unlike the self-created scandals at say Enron of a couple decades ago, or a more recent one at Theranos, the fraud case at that medical testing company, or even like 9-11, the terrorist attack that happened now 20, almost 20 years ago, this is a global economic shutdown, the likes of which we have really never ever seen, and I certainly hope we don't see anytime soon again. Just in the last two weeks here in the United States, 10 million people, or just shy of 10 million people, have filed for unemployment. That's staggering. And such a terrible crisis, both healthcare, both a public health crisis, and an economic crisis, calls for a particular kind of management. And I would argue management that explicitly thinks about and considers the consequences of one's actions and specifically the ethical and moral consequences of one's actions and decisions. They say that when the chips are down is when you really find out about a person's character. Well, that's true of a company as well. And in such a time, it can be very difficult under this kind of pressure to make the right decisions for our company, for our employees and for everyone involved. So I think it would be helpful to look at a few different lenses, ethical lenses through which we can view our decision-making during this time of crisis. So the first one is virtue ethics. This is most closely associated with the great philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. Virtue ethics ask, what kind of person will I become if I take this action? Is this decision consistent with my being my most virtuous self? Is this action consistent with my company acting at its best? It's extremely important during a crisis to communicate with compassion to our customers, to show them that we understand what they're going through, to have empathy, and never to ask either our employees or our customers to do anything that we wouldn't be willing to do ourselves. Another ethical lens that you could view this crisis through would be the deontological approach. That's just a fancy word for duty or obligation. So the deontological approach is a rules-based approach. It's closely associated with things like the biblical golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's also associated with Immanuel Kant, the great German philosopher of the 18th century. Kant had something called the categorical imperative. And what that said is act such that your action could or should become a universal law. So he was also looking at the intent or the will behind our actions. Kant also talked about seeing the other as an end in and of him or herself and never ever as a means to an end. So what he meant by that is that human beings are meant to be valued simply because they are, simply because they're human. 
and should never ever be seen as a means for us to get to where we want to go. So for example, in this view, certainly you could never engage in price gouging because that is just seeing desperate people who need supplies, who need food, who need all of the different kinds of things that we see in shortage now, seeing them just as a means to higher profits. Price gouging is unfortunately going on right now. And Kant would say that that is simply using human beings as a means to our end of maximizing profits. And that shouldn't be done. And we have seen some of these examples of price gouging like you're talking about. So, um, you know, when you, when you look at these approaches that have already been violated even today, but there's some violations that have taken place historically that you talk about. Yes, and one particular example comes to mind. So I've done some research on a company called Insys, which is a drug company in Arizona. Insys developed an under the tongue fentanyl spray for end of life pain patients. These are patients who are in terrible pain, literally at the very end of their life. This fentanyl spray is 50 times stronger than heroin. Insys salespeople began to market this drug to regular pain patients. And they did this by bribing doctors to do so. They would offer these doctors speaking engagements, which really were just dinners with some of their clients. They would offer these doctors special trips, special gifts in order to prescribe this under the tongue fentanyl spray, which they called subsis to their regular pain patients. And we're talking about patients with sports injuries, patients with, that had been in car accidents, and definitely didn't have the kind of pain that was severe enough to warrant a drug 50 times stronger than heroin. In fact, the most telling episode of this whole sordid affair was getting a salesperson on tape saying, the cancer patients are just small potatoes, quote unquote, small potatoes. They're not gonna get us the kind of numbers we need. We need the regular pain patients because that's gonna get us the profits we need. If I have ever seen an example of a company seeing human beings, in this case, desperate patients, as a means to their end and not as human beings in and of themselves, as a, an end in and of themselves worthy of care and of the proper treatment, if I've ever seen a case of that, it was this case. What about any other lenses or approaches to the whole ethical dilemmas that these guys face? So I guess another way to look at crisis management or look at leadership or ethical leadership during crisis management would be the concept of legalism. This is really just saying, follow the law. Whatever is legal is in essence ethical. That lens seems a little too small or a little too narrow right now. For example, legalism would just say, I can't bribe a company overseas because that violates the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act but isn't it ethically and morally wrong to engage in bribery? And shouldn't we somehow know that or follow that for a reason other than that it's just against the law? Legalism would also, for example, say to us right now, you're not supposed to go out of the house. You're supposed to do social distancing. And if you do, and if the police see you in a group larger than 10 people, then they can arrest you or fine you. But shouldn't we want to engage in social distancing just because it's the right thing to do, it's the ethical thing to do, and it's the moral thing to do because other people and their lives are depending on us? In the same vein, light of day is an ethical lens through which you can view your management and your decision making in a time of crisis. Light of day is also called the newspaper standard. If I take this action, or if I make this decision, would it be okay with me if it were on the front page of the Washington Post or the New York Times? This one also seems a little narrow and small for this moment. Shouldn't we want to do the right thing, not because we might get outed, not because we might get caught, but because it's the right thing to do? So another ethical lens that I think is particularly relevant and valuable here is utilitarianism. This is most closely associated with John Stuart Mill, the great 19th century British philosopher. And utilitarianism is also called the greater good theory. And what it's trying to do is maximize or optimize the outcome that will be the best for the greatest number of people. So the first thing you need to do 
is find out who all will be affected by our decisions, who all will be affected by the way that I manage through this crisis. And once you do that, you're basically looking at what is the best possible outcome that I can achieve for the greatest number of people in this situation. An example of this might be terminating or reducing the salary of top level management so that you can keep a greater number of lower level employees. This is already happening in the coronavirus crisis at Marriott, at Dick Sporting Goods, and at many of the airlines. This is both a symbolic action and also a cost cutting way to keep the largest number of employees and keep things going as if our world were normal when it's actually not. Another way that utilitarianism is coming into play, unfortunately, is some excruciating decisions that are being made in hospitals in New York right now and will probably soon be made in hospitals all around the country. So if you look again that this is an outcome-based ethical lens that's saying, how do I optimize the outcome for the greatest number of people? And we're in an environment of scarce resources, not enough ventilators, not enough personal equipment for our healthcare workers. What you're going to see is unfortunately the type of calculation that says, we're going to decline to use a ventilator on this elderly patient who's already sick, already old, and has not very many years left to live most likely so that we can use the ventilator for a younger patient who's healthier but who's struggling through this disease. Those are horrible decisions to have to make, but utilitarianism says these are the practical trade-offs that we have to make to optimize the best outcome for the greatest number of people. And yet another way that utilitarianism comes into play is looking at the trade-off between the economic concerns of this crisis and the public health concerns. So at some point, if the economy continues to go like it's going now, and we have millions of unemployment claims every week, we're going to start seeing terrible problems that are caused by this economic shutdown. We're already seeing them. But for example, domestic violence, suicides, hunger, poverty, homelessness, all of these things are already getting worse and will only continue to get worse as this crisis goes along. So there could be a utilitarian calculation that's coming up relatively soon that will say, we need to think about reopening this economy or at least partially reopening this economy, even though we haven't gotten this public health crisis under control. I could certainly see some of those kinds of utilitarian trade-offs being made. They're already being talked about. You already have some business leaders who are asking, shouldn't we just open the economy now and hope for the best and see what happens because of all of the hardship that's happening, particularly in the restaurant sector, the entertainment sector, travel, and some of the other uh, parts of our economy and the global economy that are essentially completely shut down now. Are there any other factors that come into play there besides those that you just talked about? Um, you know, from the standpoint of just other segments of the, the population that might come into play in those decisions. So I think that all of these ethical lenses and all of these ways of making decisions through a time of true crisis are really valuable. It's valuable to look at virtues and how a virtuous person would manage. It's valuable to look at rules like the golden rule or Kant's idea that the other is never a means to an end, but always an end in and of him or herself. And it's valuable to look at the types of utilitarian trade-offs that we may have to make, where in order to optimize the best possible outcome for the greatest number of people, we're gonna to have to make some really, really hard trade-offs and some very difficult decisions. But I still think that the most valuable and really useful and practical way to move forward through this crisis is stakeholder theory. Stakeholder theory has its roots in American pragmatism, the philosophy of William James and Charles Pierce, and in modern times, Richard Rorty. In business schools, the, I would say the father of stakeholder theory in business schools is Ed Freeman from the University of Virginia. He wrote a book in the early 1980s where he posited that the interests of the shareholder and of the owner are not paramount over the interests of all the other stakeholders. 
And in fact, if you take into account the interests of all your stakeholders, shareholders and owners will also be rewarded as well. So if you're looking through the lens of stakeholder theory as a way to try to guide you through this crisis, and I do think it's the most valuable way to look at a crisis like this, you basically look at, examine, take into account each of your stakeholder relationships and try to do the best you can to manage that relationship in the best possible way. So for example, with our employees, how are they feeling? What are they going through? What are their emotions? I was thinking the other day about how we are all feeling a sense of disillusionment, disorientation, fear, exhaustion. But none of those things really described for me precisely what we're really going through. And I started to think about grief, that we're all grieving a different life, the life we had a few weeks ago, the life we had a few months ago. And the five stages of grief are a good way to look at what many of our employees, and, and for that matter, we as managers, we as college professors, all of us are feeling at this time. So if you go through the five stages, first there's denial. The coronavirus is no big deal. It's not gonna really hurt anybody. It's sort of like the flu, um, it'll go away soon. And then you have anger. Wait a minute, I can't do what I wanted to do. I don't have my life. I can't go on trips. I can't get married. I can't go out to a restaurant. Things are different now. I can't do the things I want and that makes me really angry. And then you have bargaining. Okay, I'll social distance for two weeks and everything will go away and it will all get back to normal. And then when you realize that's not true, there's sadness and depression as this long slog of dealing with this truly unprecedented crisis sets in. And we realize that most of us are largely prisoners in our own house. And finally, hopefully, all of us will get to the stage of acceptance where we say, okay, this is the new reality and we have to make the best of it. So as managers, if those are the kinds of emotions and those are the kinds of stages our employees are going through, we need to treat them with the utmost care, compassion, and concern. If we need to furlough some of our employees, we need to communicate that in the most sensitive way possible. If we need, God forbid, to lay off quite a number of employees, as we can see is happening everywhere today, we have to tell them or at least assure them that we'll try if we possibly can to give them their job back when this whole thing is over. And we certainly need to communicate with the best care and sensitivity that we possibly can with all of our employees. And for example, try to do things like give them their health care if we can, continue to offer them the benefits as we go through this crisis. And we can certainly try at least if we can to extend healthcare benefits, even for furloughed or laid off employees for a time, if that's at all possible. And with regard to our customers, if we look at stakeholder theory with regard to our customers, how can we serve them the best we can? So restaurants are doing curbside takeout, airlines are offering extended refunds and extended rebookings um, with no penalty. Resorts are giving people their money back. I just had to cancel a big trip to Hawaii this May and the resort immediately gave me my money back. And so you have to do the best you can, even if you're, even as you're seeing your profits plummeting and having all these other problems, you have to try to continue to serve your customers in the best way that you can and to communicate with them as well as you can. I had wrote a case on a spinning studio, so an exercise studio here in Southern California. And that owner is renting out all of his bikes for a couple hundred dollars a month and then starting online classes for his customers. So all of these different kinds of strategies are the types of things that companies are trying to do to continue to serve their customers through this really difficult time. And they're also communicating on a consistent basis all about their different policies, strategies, and ways of trying to deal with the coronavirus crisis. So in closing, I can say that some of the classical theories and the great philosophers have certainly given us ways that we can look at management through a crisis. Virtues, duty, 
and some of the types of trade-offs that you have to make according to utilitarian theory. All of these kinds of things are certainly helpful as we look at the decisions that we have in front of us, the very difficult decisions that we have to make right now. But stakeholder theory, where we take what I call an ethical audit of all of our stakeholder relationships and look at how we can best deal with each and every one of our stakeholders in that two-way relationship that we have with them. I think this is the most valuable and pragmatic and useful way to look at managing through such a huge crisis like the one we're all facing now. Well, I think your, your analysis and your ultimate conclusion is just right on the money. And I really appreciate the way you brought us through this. It makes a lot of people who are in these leadership roles feel like they at least have some kind of a map to get themselves through the minefields that they're facing and to analyze it on a, on a stakeholder by stakeholder basis because everybody is impacted. It's not something that it's one sector. It's something that every sector in society is being impacted by. And uh, I truly appreciate the time you've taken to, to talk to us. And uh, it's great to see you again. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jim. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed talking to you and I hope you stay well.